and uh, let's welcome everyone. Welcome to another seminar of this week's discoveries. My name is Pedro Russo. I'm assistant professor at Leiden Observatory and also at the Department of Science Communication and Society. And I'll be the host for this week's discovery. Uh, every week, we want really to showcase the ongoing inspiring research happening at our faculty and really share the amazing results that our colleagues are, are getting from the, the research they are doing. And uh, But before we start with the pre today's presentation, we'd like to have a feeling who is attending this session. So we have two very simple questions. Uh, so we're going to see a poll that I think you have it now. And from where are you coming from? Which institute? And also, what's your career level? Uh, so I think you have the question now. So just try to... All right. Mathematics Institute. Our colleagues from physics. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. That gives us also a feeling for who is attending these um, these seminars, and also for us to maybe to find the right level for the presentations, also to advise the the next speakers. Uh, so I'm going to share the results with you. So today's speaker is, is Joe Callingham. He's a, a colleague from the Leiden Observatory. It's a, a Vanny Fellow and he was born and raised in Australia, but he's been working with us for, for some, some time now. And uh, Joe is going to talk, talk about exoplanets. So, Joe, welcome. And I guess the microphone and the screen is yours. Thanks, Pedro. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'm just going to share my screen and just make sure everything's getting underway. Um, you confirm that's all good, Pedro? All good. Yeah, great. All right, thanks for having me. And thanks for everyone having an extra Zoom meeting uh, in your lunch break. Uh, hopefully, I'll keep you entertained. I understand everyone's getting a, a bit Zoom fatigued. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of the cool stuff coming out of uh, some research I've been doing at, at Leiden Observatory, and particularly with the uh, Dutch radio telescope called LOFAR, which I'll give more details in our talk. Um, yeah, so uh, as Pedro said, my name is Joe Callingham, and, and I'm, I'm uh, a Venny Fellow based here at, at Leiden. Um, sorry, <laughs> things are taking over my computer. Um, and uh, what I want to do just before I go further is that only reason I give this talk is because I have, I have fantastic collaborators, particularly Hirsch van Dedham, Tim Schimmel based at Astron, the Netherlands Institute for Radio Astronomy, Ben Pope at NYU Flatiron, who's just started a tenure track position in Australia, and, and Ignis and, and Trent Depoy at Edinburgh. Um, but th those are names that might not mean, mean much to you, but like I wouldn't be able to present this work without, without them. So I was asked just to give a little bit of background about myself and my research before I start. Uh, I think Pedro more or less said the most of it. Um, maybe by my accent, you might tell that I'm Australian. Uh, I originally was born uh, in a, a small town in Australia, but most, spent most of my teenage and, and adult years in, in Sydney. Uh, you got a photo of me on the right here. This is based in, in the outback of Australia the, at a radio telescope called the Murchison White Field Array. You might not think of that a radio telescope. It doesn't really look like what most people think of radio telescopes, but they're essentially just fancy coat hangers, which allows us to observe at really low frequencies in the universe, uh, at the universe at really low frequencies. And so I've been based in the Netherlands for about four years here, but it's originally at Astron, now at Leiden, and I enjoy most things that Australians like, which is mostly good weather, I should put here, which is why you guys are, are being really nice about joining my thing to uh, joining this talk today because it's amazing weather outside. Um, okay, so a bit about my research. I was asked to put it on this plot of um, short term versus long term impact of uh, research, fundamental versus applied. It was a, it, it's an interesting um, kind of uh, metric of, of how I put my research here. I, most astronomy usually either has a long term or indirect impact of society. And I think this is probably where I'd put mine. Um, it's somewhere between fundamental and applied because fundamental, as I'll show you soon, if people are interested in plasma physics, you can really uh, get some ideas and test um, some ideas of plasma physics in a laboratory that you couldn't really make easily on, on Earth. Um, but it's also technically applied too because I'm applying what a lot of theorists have, have developed. So I don't know, that's where I'd put it. It's an interesting uh, thought experiment. Uh, thanks, Pedro, for making me think about it. But um, yeah, I don't know if that tells you much. Uh, I'm about to be talking about planets and brown dwarfs uh, very far away. So I, I don't think we'll ever be traveling them to have a direct impact on society anytime soon. So maybe just to make sure everyone's on the same page, we're kind of at an amazing point in astronomy uh, today where finding planets around other stars called exoplanets is actually 
standard. Like it's becoming routine. I wouldn't describe it as easy, right? It still takes a lot of effort, takes huge amount of expertise. But if I said, I'm really interested in this star out there, we do have the technology today to tell us whether there's a planet around that star. And that's kind of, it was a really amazing time to be in. And that's only really developed over the past 20 to 30 years. We've been able to do that type of, that type of science. And I'm just showing you a kind of smattering of the different types of planetary systems we've found. This is by no means exhaustive. And you can kind of see the solar system in the background in the dashes. And you see these, all these little uh, smaller uh, stellar systems uh, around it. And you can see our bias to our methods are to short period, massive things. That's just by nature, if you observe something for, if you try to find something like Earth via transit RV methods, I'm not going to worry too much about details about that. You tend to, um, you have to sit there for a very long time. If you want something close to the star, it's much easier to find. But there's a few unknowns in this field. Now that we're finding planets in a regular way, uh, a big unknown that we want to start answering is, well, is it possible to find something like an Earth twin or what does it make it uh, a planet potentially habitable? And to, to answer this question, there's a few uh, stars I have to introduce. So everyone knows our sun. Um, in astronomy terminology, this is called a G dwarf. Not too big, not too little, somewhere in the middle. Uh, it's about one solar mass for a, a nice unit, a non-SI unit of measure. Um, and then you have much smaller, uh, much smaller stars called red dwarfs or M dwarfs. So you can see here, they're about 10% the mass of the sun, but they're still stars. And the definition of a star to, to most astronomers is, is it undergoing nuclear fusion in its core? Is it turning hydrogen to helium or at least some other lighter element to a more heavy element in, in, in it, under its surface? Um, and so M dwarfs still do that. And they're about 10% the mass, mass of the sun. And there's heaps of those, right? It's much easier to form something less massive in the universe. But then there's this really weird tail that kind of overlaps with Jupiter when you start going down what's called the mass ladder. And this is what are called brown dwarfs. And, and the name kind of is similar why we call them uh, our, um, our, our, our smaller cousins to the sun red dwarfs is that as you go to lower mass, they get, they get cooler. And so they become redder and redder and redder. And so some, some genius sort of the name brown dwarf, uh, they're all often called ultra cool dwarfs as well. So these are much less massive and they're no longer undergoing nuclear fusion in their core. So they can get big enough, like we're talking about maybe 10 times the mass of Jupiter. They can get big enough that they do deuterium fusion in the outside area. So that can be, that's why they're warm in some cases, but that doesn't last very long because there's only so much deuterium you can really have. But um, what's really interesting here is that they tend to overlap in this mass range with Jupiter. And so some of the physics that apply to Jupiter will probably be more applicable to the ultra cool dwarfs than for example, the physics of our sun. And, and why would this be interesting? Why are we, we, why am I banging on about this? Well, it's because um, if you look at Jupiter with radio telescopes or with say Hubble, these famous optical telescopes, you see beautiful aurorae on these surfaces of these stars. And these aurorae, you know, just like on earth and what I got in my background, right? Um, are direct probes of the magnetic field strength of these bodies. So a big unknown that we just, uh, as I'll explain in a second, is what, what um, role does the magnetic field play in planets outside our solar system to say potentially make a, a place that's nice for say humans to live or life to evolve on. So one way you can get emission from a brown dwarf that's in the radio um, is via uh, rapid rotation, things spinning really fast uh, for complicated terms. It doesn't really matter what the uh, mechanism is, but it's called breakdown and co-rotation. You have a whole bunch of plasma trapped around a star. It's spinning fast and you can create a circuit. This is very similar um, to the dynamo on your, on your bike. You just make an electrodynamic engine and you can get some unique plasma physics that drives these beautiful uh, aurora on the, on the poles of the star. The other one that's really fantastic is the Jupiter-Io interaction in, in Earth. So Io is literally a conductor and the magnetic fields of Jupiter sweep over Io. And this is great because as, as you know, if you have the physicists online, you have a, a, a variable magnetic field passing over a conductor, obviously you can induce all types of, uh, of currents and particularly you end up driving these aurorae on the surfaces. And so this is just a Hubble picture. This is not a simulation from, from uh, in UV in the, uh, in the blue. And what you can see here is a ring. That ring is caused by that breakdown of co-rotation I mentioned when it's spinning really fast. And then you have these kind of footprints and then tails, which are the interaction with the satellites. And so the idea here is if Jupiter is so bright at radio frequencies, could we find another Jupiter-like planet or like other things that are similar to it, like the uh, brown dwarfs I mentioned further away, where they could be uh, hosts uh, for, for 
hosts in stellar systems that we really want to understand uh, have ability. And why, why, you might be thinking, why is the magnetic field important at all on a planet? And why is he banging on about habitability? Well, there's, a, there's two answers to that question. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in them. But one, we know from our sun, which I'm showing you here, is that not always a star a great host. You can have what's called a coronal mass ejection in the outside, uh, uh, in the corona of the star, which causes uh, mildly relativistic, the relativistic particles to spew into the, the, um, into the solar system. And that can directly impact the planet and cause atmospheric er erosion. We think this is one of the reasons Mars uh, doesn't have much of an atmosphere compared to the Earth as it does today. And uh, so we, uh, that's one problem. And number two, what I'm showing you here is the impact of a, a CME on the Earth's, Earth's magnetic field. This is kind of a simulation of, um, of uh, the Carrington event for people that are familiar, really big coronal mass ejection that hit Earth in the 1850s, I think. I can't remember the, the, the exact date, but knocked out the telegraph network and that kind of stuff. Um, the the uh, coronal mass ejection is coming in red, so that just represents density. And the Earth's magnetic field here is shown in the white, and you can kind of see it compress and act as a bow shock and push and pull this uh, material around it. Um, so there's really big unknowns about outside of the solar system. What is the magnetic field of, of all these planets we're finding? Uh, does it is it consistent with what we see in the solar system? And if if that's the case, could they, for example, around a brown dwarf or an M dwarf? Um, uh, keep their atmosphere in the face of that type of activity I just mentioned there, because the sun actually is quite a nice host relative to particularly some of these smaller stars that erupt much more regularly. And so what we did, how do we start to find these kind of planets outside the solar system or these brown dwarfs where, where are they a star or are they a planet? They have this uh, intermediate mass range. Um, what we've done is we've used the uh, Dutch telescope called LOFAR. It kind of looked like what I did before. I'm sorry, my movie has lost. Uh, that's... It's my own fault. I usually have a movie of Lofi here. End of the day, it's based in Duinglo out in Drenta. Hopefully most people have heard about it or seen it. The main thing is I'm looking at the sky at essentially FM frequencies. So like 150 megahertz, just like when you get in your car and you drive down the highway, you listen to radio. I'm trying to look at the universe at, at those frequencies. And you need to work at low frequencies because there's a spectrum of these things. You can't do it at high frequencies. But again, if you're interested in, in those details, feel free to ask me. And so what we did was try to find radio sources that were um, very polarized. That aurora I talked about has the characteristic that it's very highly circularly polarized. So this means there's a very preferential direction in which the photon is, the electric field is, um, is uh, orientated uh, and it's a circular polarization faction. And that's just got to do with the emission process. So if you find circular polarization, you could potentially finding stars and planets. And so that's, that's uh, the, the fundamental search criteria we had. And this was our first detection, which we nicknamed Elahas uh, after a uh, Dutch folklore. Uh, if there's any Dutch people online, um, uh, this is the uh, Charlemagne stuff. But again, if you're interested in knowing why we named it exactly that, we thought it'd be fun. Um, but it, it, it kind of is fitting as well. So on the left here is what's called a total intensity uh, detection. This is this faint little blob on the, on, in the center here. This is about a Milijansky that's quite faint for people uh, that's... Uh, not familiar, as you would expect, this thing we thought is potentially a planet or a brown dwarf. And on the right, what you've got here is in Stokes V is a circular polarization detection. So you can see it very strongly detected in Stokes I and Stokes V. You might notice there's another source at the top left here. This is just a background radio galaxy. So this is material falling into a black hole. But luckily for us, this is why we can do this search really well, is that they aren't circularly polarized. So you can throw away all the AGN and most of the radio sky are these black holes feeding, right? And obviously interesting in their own right, but not my main science goal. Okay, so we found a radio source and this is, but the question is, what is this radio source? It's highly circularly polarized. We think it's a brown dwarf, but the only way to confirm that is to go to an optical telescope, the classic mirror and confirm that it has the characteristics you expect because there's no brown dwarf known previously at this location. And that's what we did. We went ran away and uh, went to the eight meter telescopes in Hawaii, uh, Gemini North in particular. And what you can see, particularly on the right, you can see this very clear detection in what's called a methane band. And this is because these things are so cool, you actually can form molecules in their surfaces and that can be a really distinctive way of finding it. And um, this is uh, the spectra. Again, for non-experts, it's not a, a big deal. It's just uh, in the background is the raw data that's in, um, in, in gray, in the black is the smooth data, uh, which is the uh, smooth gray data. And then overplotted are templates. 
this is kind of a very classic astronomy approach of trying to characterize things and get an idea of what they look like. And they're just different templates of, of archetypal uh, sources of their classes. And for people familiar, the astronomers online, T6.5, dwarf, for everyone else online, what does this mean? It's incredibly cool dwarf. This is where you're now entering the boundary of what is the difference between a planet and, and, a, and a star starts to break down. And it doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, so great. Um, so what? So I'm saying we found a new brown dwarf slash exoplanet out there, um, but brown dwarfs have been known to be radio bright for years since the mid 2000s. Uh, this is with other instruments. Um, but the big difference here and why it's an interesting discovery is because unlike before, uh, we've approached this problem very differently in a way that radio astronomers couldn't previously do. Uh, the difference here is that previously we had to rely on our optical colleagues, the people with the mirrors, go and they find these radio, uh, these, um, these brown dwarfs, and then we point our radio telescopes and confirm if we can see it in the radio or not. This is the first time where we did that the reverse, where we found a really um, interesting candidate in, in, in the radio, and then we follow it up optically. So that means your biases are slightly different, and maybe we've seen something slightly different in terms of the emission characteristics, or is it what's unique about this source? Um, so what did we find? Well, a big weird thing that we found was this thing's incredibly bright, much brighter than we'd expect a priori. Um, the spectral class, so when we did all that template feeding, um, implies that the source is very far distant, so 70 parsecs. Now, I have to, if I translate this to light years, which is a more common metric, oh, I can't remember, 100 light years away, something like that. It doesn't matter, very far away, much further away than we expect. Uh, we would have expected to find things around 10 parsecs, like a nearly an order of magnitude closer. And that's what all other radio brown dwarfs have essentially been at. You know, these brown dwarfs that have been found previously in the radio with other telescopes using that old method of infrared than radio follow up have all been uh, very close. Um, so, therefore, the radio luminosity of this source is over two orders of magnitude than previous. So, the question is why? And we don't have a good answer for that. Potentially, one of the ideas we had here is that it's really easy to boost the, uh, the radio flux if you have a companion next to it. Remember the Jupiter-Io interaction I mentioned before? Now, just replace Jupiter with this brown dwarf and Io with, say, a larger uh, companion. It could be a, a Jupiter-like, like maybe a little small Jupiter, a Neptune, or it could be an Earth. It doesn't really matter. That's one way to really boost this flux quite high. So, but, or, so potentially, we could be seeing like kind of these equivalent of exomoons or the, this is where our terminology kind of breaks down um, uh, in terms of describing what, what we're seeing here. And furthermore, we have a direct probe of the magnetic field of this, this system, and it has about 25 Gauss at least. Um, so that's a Gauss is a 10 to the minus 4 Tesla for the SI people out there. Um, so that's large, but not ridiculously large. Uh, it's about Jupiter's about 10 Gauss. So it's, it's at least double Jupiter's uh, magnetic field, but that's kind of based on our selection bias also uh, uh, probably why we're seeing it. So maybe just to, to finish and hopefully take some of your questions, hopefully I've stayed roughly on time. What, what is the, the, the takeaways from my talk? It's the first direct discovery of a brown dwarf uh, exoplanet analog using just the radio, uh, or using radio first. And that means we have a new parameter space and it gives us different biases. So trying to understand some of those questions we asked earlier is a bit, bit, e uh, bit, bit different. We're approaching the problem from a different direction. Um, and because it's so bright, we essentially have this problem where like either our understanding of emission from the magnetosphere is incomplete. So from the plasma around this stuff, or we're seeing a different type of emission, potentially an exomoon or this other object around it. Um, and so in terms of future outlook, one, we're doing an all sky survey with low fire. So we should find a whole bunch more of these, but also for people that might be familiar, there's the uh, square kilometer array that's just been uh, featured heavily where um, the treaty organization has been established. This is going to be a big billion dollar radio telescope based in South Africa and Australia that based on the sensitivity should find tens of thousands of these things. So we're entering a domain again now where the radio can find these objects really easy and we might be able to answer some of those harder press questions I raised earlier about what does it mean to have a magnetic field and what does that mean for potential life around these things. And if you're interested in reading the paper, it's there as well. So thank you.